are waiting for Supervisor Hines. I think he's going to be joining us in person. So hopefully we'll begin in a few minutes. Good morning, welcome to the May 11th, 2022 Board of Supervisors budget hearing meeting. Um, let's start with a roll call. Supervisor Christie. Here. Supervisor Grijalva. Here. Supervisor Hines. Supervisor Scott. Here. Chair Bronson. Here. Let the record show Supervisor Hines is out. All other board members are present. I'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Supervisor Grijalva. Okay. Uh -uh. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yo le doy mi altar a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América a la república que representa una nación bajo Dios, invisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. And then the land acknowledgement statement to be read by Supervisor Grijalva. Okay. On behalf of Pima County residents, we honor the tribal nations who have served as caretakers of this land from time immemorial and respectfully acknowledge the ancestral homelands of the, the Tohono O'odham Nation and the multi-millennial presence of the Basquayaki tribe within Pima County. Consistent with Pima County's commitment to diversity and inclusion, we strive toward building equal partner relationships with Arizona's tribal nations. Thank you, Supervisor Grijalva. Does anybody need a moment of personal privilege or should we move on? All right. Oh, I, oh, it, just one, just one. It is um, National School Nurses Day. So give some love to the school nurses that have been working so hard f to keep all of our um, children safe and in school. Thanks. And given the interesting uh, budget issues with uh, school districts, you still have school nurses? We do. Yes, they work very hard and are over several schools, one person touching on several schools, but they, they are there doing great work every day. All right, let's move on then. Item four is county budget. Ms. Slesher already made a presentation yesterday, so let's move on to department budgets presentations and as I said yesterday, if none of you, if any of you were listening, be brief, be sincere, and be seated. Uh, and um, we're in interesting times with hyperinflation, uh, with some of the COVID money going away at the national level, not coming here. And um, given the, I guess it's good news because that means more money coming into our budget, but for homeowners, who have seen a rise in evaluation, they're going, their taxes are going to go up. And in the time of hyperinflation, that um, is not, um, not something they, I'm sure, want to see. So with that, let's start with behavioral health. Who's presenting? And state your name and your title. Good morning, I'm Paula Pereira. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health for Pima County. Um, behavioral Health uh, funds and administers both mandated and discretionary services for folks who, well, health services for folks who, the majority of whom are in some sort of crisis and that crisis intersects with the legal system in one fashion or another. So everything from individuals who are currently incarcerated or detained in our adult and juvenile detention centers, individuals who are experiencing a mental health crisis and um, need to undergo an involuntary psychiatric evaluation um, to victims of crime, uh, dangerous crimes against children, uh, victims of sexual assault, uh, people experiencing do domestic violence, as well as folks who um, are undergoing restoration to competency services so that they can be tried um, in our judicial system. So I'll just give you a quick overview of um, 
some of the projects, the things that we've been doing this past year and what our hopes for next year, our projects and goals are for next year. So in our correctional health um, unit, we installed a new electronic health record, which gives us greater visibility and granularity into the data of um, our detention population in both the adult and, de and juvenile detention facilities, which will help us um, inform our decision making going forward about wh where targeted specific needs are and give us a better understanding of who's in our jail and what their needs are. Um, unfortunately, last year we had to go out for RFP for a new medical services vendor and, um, and we currently have another RFP out for those services as um, the board directed that uh, that contract only lasts for one year. So we are back out for RFP for medical services vendor. Um, another really big thing that happened this last year is that we obtained our own opioid treatment license, um, which allows us to provide Medicaid, medication assisted treatment for um, individuals in the adult detention facility, um, which is, fantastic. Um, it's much better than having to rely on community providers to come into the facility and make sure that that communication is working. We hope that by implementing our own um, MAP program that we will reduce um, opportunity for um, error and for harmful um, outcomes. Um, so we are in the process of modifying our contract with our existing health vendor to add staffing um, for that MAT services program to ensure that the MAT services that we are offering meet or exceed community standards. Um, we will also be surveyed by the National Commission on Correctional Health Care, um, which will give us an additional accreditation. The jail is accredited for medical services. Um, with this opioid thing, we hope to be accredited for um, the OTP or the MAT services program, as well as we have uh, reached out and hired a consultant to come do a survey, a mock survey of us, so that we can be accredited uh, in the behavioral health um, realm, which will make us one of only a handful of facilities in the nation that is accredited in all three areas, um, which we're looking forward to. We are using some of um, our ARPA allocation to expand dental services and vaccines for children in a juvenile detention facility. As you may be aware, um, for some of those kids, that's the only health care that they are going to get. So we try and take advantage of the opportunity while we have them to make sure they get care. Our restoration to competency program, this is its 15th year in operation. Uh, you will be pleased to know that it pays for itself within the first quarter. It costs the county about $700,000 a year to operate uh, the restoration to competency program, but we save over $4 million a year um, by not having to send people to the Arizona State Hospital to get those services. Um, we have a new claims processing um, software program um, in our claims management utilization, which we um, purchased so that we can move away from a manual claims payment um, system and um, make it much more efficient and um, transparent for our providers. We've also uh, created and posted a provider manual on our website for um, our contracted providers um, just to make sure that, that the county reflects how the industry standard is in, in the rest of the world. Um, we also have the INVEST program. Some of you may be familiar with it, but it is a grant funded program involving individuals who have both mental health and substance use diagnoses who are re-entering our community from the jail. Um, we call it a treatment reform um, program, and uh, it's, it's a critical time intervention, but it's an intensive intervention with the hope of breaking the cycle of crisis for those individuals so that they can lead healthier lives free from substances and, and um, interaction with the justice involvement. Um, it's a randomized control trial, so we um, are going to have some good data coming out of it. So we, we hope to be able to demonstrate that um, rethinking treatment for that population is the better solution than, um, than what's available today. Um, 
We also intend to use a portion of our ARPA allocation to um, create a program called uh, Invest 2.0, because we're very creative in um, titles, um, which will um, get people, so once they finish the initial um, invest uh, participation, they will be able to enroll in the, the second half of it, which is for permanent supportive housing and job training to make sure that um, we're getting their skill sets up to par. Um, our admin unit, um, we, one thing that we discovered with all of our programs is that we really need to beef up our clinical piece of our, our department so that um, we can respond to our vendors when they're telling us, you know, the sky is purple, and when we're thinking, mm, we think maybe it's blue. Um, to have that medical direction and also to help us um, have the expertise, the subject matter expertise to create the programming correctly. Um, for victim services, we have, um, we our department funded last year um, a needs assessment um, utilizing CIRO, the Southwest Institute for Research on Women. Um, that needs assessment was completed last month and distributed, and you may have seen a memo in relation to that. The two, um, the two major findings for, from that needs assessment are that folks feeling de domestic violence really are in need of, of many things, but the, the top two are access to legal services and housing assistance. So um, I have shamelessly um, copied what community and workforce development is doing with the EELS program, the Emergency Eviction uh, Legal Services. I intend to um, create that type of a program for uh, working with the U of A Law School um, Clinic on Domestic Violence. Um, to provide that population, th those who require um, an attorney, access to attorneys, um, as well as working with community and workforce development and the city of Tucson um, for to get people fleeing domestic violence kind of to the front of the housing line. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing. Do you have questions? Any qu well, I think you're doing some amazing things, and thank you, but uh, questions? Chair Bronson, um, you mentioned something about a vendor that was a one-year contract, yes. and then you had to go out again. Is um, Was that something that was restricted by any language that, that we're sort of getting in the way of? Can we do like a <laughs> Up to three years or something. I just want to make sure that it's it's something that is not a policy that is making your life. No, it was a very unusual circumstance. Okay. It was an unanticipated um, cessation of our contract with our prior vendor, so okay. we had, had to do kind of a, an emergency procurement, as it were, okay. and so we we said. We'll just do the one year, and then we'll go back out to bid because we didn't competitively bid okay. this contract. All right, great. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything we needed to Yeah, we're just trying to be okay. as transparent for the, the public as possible. Okay. Any, any other questions? Madam Chair. Supervisor. I had two questions, but Supervisor Grijalva <laughs> asked the first one. Thank you very much. Uh, second one is, Ms. Pereira, I really appreciate uh, what we are doing for uh, in the correctional health area for detainees mm -hmm. in the juvenile detention facility, expanding mm -hmm. uh, benefits because you're right, they may be the only access to health care that some of those kids have. What is the possibility of sustaining uh, those benefits after uh, federal pandemic relief funds are exhausted? So in, in terms of the dental services, all we really needed to do was buy some, some equipment. So it's a one-time cost for that. Um, and the same, roughly the same, for vaccines, we need to get specialized um, refrigerators and freezers and then the vaccine itself. Um, we hope to, to be uh, a vaccines for children site, and so we should be able to get vaccine from the federal government for this population as well. Um, and we utilize our existing um, vendor, the, the nurses and the dentists that um, we already contract for to provide that service. And some of that, uh, some of that care is preventive care? Some of it. Okay. Not, not uh, we, we have, currently, no. Currently, it's not preventative, but that we're hoping to to move in that direction. To, if if to, that uh, proceeds, would certainly appreciate any updates that you're able to share with the board. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. 
Supervisor Christine. Tell me a little bit about the medical services vendor. Um, what do they provide and, and what, are, what are their functions in your department? The medical services vendor um, is contracted vendor. They provide medical and behavioral health care and MAT services um, in the adult and juvenile detention facility. So it's ev all kinds of health care, whatever the need may be, um, to the extent that it's capable of being provided in the detention setting. There are certain health conditions that like, if somebody needs surgery, uh, that doesn't happen in the jail. Those individuals are sent out to a hospital to receive that care, but they provide whatever care the, the population requires. And what is the annual cost of that contract? It's roughly $18 million. Um, well, and it may, it may indeed go up again this year um, because we have to go back out for RFP and um, inflation and costs are, are rising. So it's difficult to So to you keep contract that. with a medical vendor and they come into your, the facilities and, and, and assess uh, your clients or how, how does it work? So the, the medical vendor um, comes into both, they are physically present in the jail and in the juvenile detention facility 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, they are off the first people uh, that a detainee will see when they come into the jail. They provide medical clearance. They do assessments and screenings. From there, they schedule appointments for mental health, for physical health. Um, they provide immunizations. They um, they control COVID. You know, they they do all of those those types of things for and for folks. There's no ability or um, uh, availability with our own Pima County Health Department to utilize. Uh, much of that services that you're contracting at $18 million for? You wouldn't, we don't have the employees to do it for for sure. And I don't know, um, I'm, I'm not as familiar with Dr. Cullen's department staffing, um, but I don't believe that they have the appropriately licensed and credentialed individuals to be able to provide that level of care 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Pima County Health Department would not have those I, I don't believe so, but that would be a better question for, for Dr. Cullen. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Uh, Madam Chair. Supervisor. <laughs> Just to follow up on some of Supervisor Christie's uh, uh, questions, uh, Ms. Lesher, these are um, statutory obligations uh, that we are uh, fulfilling, and I don't believe that we get any support from the state of Arizona in terms of fulfilling those statutory obligations with regard to uh, behavioral health in our correctional facilities, do we? And, and Chair Bronson, Supervisor Scott, that is correct and we do not. And just for clarification and background, um, back in the day, I think over 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the department was called Institutional Health. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the department that was known simply for providing services and health care in the jail. Uh, and, and we are required to provide those services for the jail. In effect, our clients are uh, Sheriff Nanos and the folks who run the jail uh, and the people who are in the jail. Um, and we are obligated to provide services over a period of time. The, the name has changed, but the services remain the same in the institutions. Over the course of the years, have we ever had discussions with, uh, uh, with Mr. Rossi uh, about uh, pursuing any kind of uh, uh, assistance? Uh, uh, from the state to help meet those statutory requirements? I know, but I have been asked. <laughs> Chair Bronson, Supervisor Scott, yes. All right, thank you. And the answer was? <laughs> Yes, we have had regular conversations with Mr. Rossi about hoping and that the state would pay that. And, and the state responded how? <laughs> okay, no. we'll move on. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter will be Community and Workforce Development. And again, state your name and title for the record. I guess I gotta move this up. Um, good
Good morning, Chair Bronson, members of the board. Uh, my name is Dan Sullivan. I'm the director of the Pima County Community and Workforce Development Department. <clears throat> and I'm proud to be here to, uh, to talk about uh, community workforce development, uh, where we embrace the, the spirit of, of Semper Gumby, always be flexible. Uh, and that's because flexibility and nim uh, nimbleness uh, to meet the, the ever-changing community needs. Uh, specifically, over, over the last year, we've rolled out innovative programs that are revolutionizing how we do work for folks in our community who are seeking workforce development services, uh, emergency rent and utility assistance, uh, housing for people experiencing homelessness, uh, eviction legal services, uh, preschool scholarships, uh, community development, home repair, and of course, uh, education and career development for young folks. Uh, and at CWD, we deliver services directly in-house, you know, with county employees, but we also partner uh, with more than 140 community-based ba community uh, organizations and key county departments, uh, either directly with us or uh, scattered throughout the, the community. And our mission uh, and service expectation is to serve with heart and urgency uh, and in partnership with the community. That's because uh, people come to us on the worst days of their lives. You know, they've been laid off. Uh, they're facing eviction. Uh, you know, they, they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. So we stress and, and are building a culture within our department to serve everybody who comes to us as if they were our brother, our sister, our mother, or our father. <clears throat> uh, so some challenges that we're, we're seeing in the community, obviously they're big. You know, people are uh, hurting. Um, there are significant challenges uh, that, that we're facing. Housing affordability probably tops that list. Uh, you know, when I first started running uh, homeless services programs about six years ago, it took us about 30 days to get somebody, you know, from uh, the streets into uh, a permanent housing location because of the, the lack of affordability, <clears throat> uh, you know, that's taking about three months now, depending. So, so that is the, the, the biggest issue. And of course, the, the changing workforce landscape, you know, we're already starting to see uh, the early signs of, of a recession come, so our dislocated worker program, we're already starting to see an uptick uh, in that. Um, increased chronic homelessness is an issue in our community, as, as we all have seen. Uh, and also, you know, I, I believe that's directly linked to a lack of low barrier shelter in our community. So, sh and that def is defined by shelter where people can go in, you know, if uh, without an income, without totally being uh, sober. You know, however, we recognize these challenges uh, and we're ready to meet them. So, I, I wanted to talk about some, some some success that, that we've had, you know, putting in new programs and really, re really revolutionizing how we do this work. You know, um, uh, before, you know, how, how it was really done is uh, we were very siloed. Community workforce development has a huge portfolio of programs and is very complex. You know, if you're if from the community looking in, seeing how do I get into workforce services, how do I get into rent and utility uh, uh, programs, was it, it's complicated for folks. Our, our real mission is to make that easy and simple and urgent for folks because people are in crisis. So, uh, you know, I'd like to talk about how folks are now sort of entering our program and how we're serving them holistically. So, for example, people who are facing eviction. Uh, the, the main thing that we're doing right now, which has been the huge game changer, is uh, moving into a navigator model. So instead of it just being a case manager over here who does workforce development services, a case manager over here who does rent and utility assistance, uh, you know, it, it's sort of almost like a jack of all trade, right? So uh, somebody experiencing uh, eviction now because of our office of emergency eviction legal services. That navigator can connect them to a lawyer if, if it is something that, that can be remedied by, by a lawyer. Uh, oftentimes it is uh, uh, rent, uh, rent that uh, will stop an eviction. Uh, but directly in the court, we have our navigators who can then um, work with landlords and tenants to stop that, that eviction from happening by paying uh, the, rentals, uh, the rent arrears. Now, if that doesn't happen, uh, we have uh, over the last couple months set up a low barrier or shelter of our own uh, as a part of a continuum of services uh, that we've developed so that folks who, who were evicted don't wind up becoming street homeless, uh, living in a, in a congregate shelter, uh, and, and specifically f uh, for kids not to wind up in those situations because that has extreme ramifications, not, not just you know, in the immediate, but for, uh, for the long-term well-being of that young person. <clears throat> So we, we stabilize people in dignified, low barrier shelter. Uh, as they're there, they're mer working with additional navigators on uh, warm referrals to other parts of our service. So instead of saying, uh, you need to get a job, dial this number. It is a warm handoff right over to our folks who, who do uh, workforce development services. Um, and also while they're 
doing that, um, we're connecting them with our youth program. So say they have uh, young folks who need a high school diploma, we're enrolling them in our uh, Pima Vocational High School program or Las Artes. Uh, it, uh, if they have really little ones, like I do, uh, we're getting them involved with uh, the PEEPS program to get them uh, early childhood um, uh, in early childhood scholarships. Um, <clears throat> so it, that's the direct stuff that we do, but, but it also doesn't encompass all the, all the indirect things that we fund throughout the community. So for example, you know, through our community, develop, community development division or outside agency, you know, they could go to the Sarita Food Bank and, and get backpacks for their kids that are funded by our social service block grant program or food that is, uh, that is provided by our outside agency program. And all throughout this, you know, so, so we're providing quality assurance. You know, over the last year, we've uh, uh, created a, a, a quality assurance team to make sure that we're doing two things. One, we're, we're doing it by the, the letter of uh, the federal government, because these are federal programs, but also uh, as important, asking the question, are we doing it right by the people who are coming to us? So, so we're looking at the data, we're, we're getting customer feedback to ensure that, that we are good stewards of these programs. And, and I'm so incredibly proud and humbled by the work uh, that our folks in our community assistance division have done since the beginning of the pandemic. And th those folks have worked nights and weekends and uh, missed birthdays to, to provide more than $33 million in rental assistance to our community, uh, to more than 12,000 households uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And that work has been nationally recognized. So uh, we're, we're in the top 10 uh, programs. You know, the, uh, the emergency rental assistance programs were very hard to get up and running. You know, I, I think what we did well in this community is we planned early and we partnered. Uh, so we partnered with the city of uh, Tucson um, to, to really have the infrastructure in place so, so that we're able to uh, roll the programs out. And, and we did so well that, you know, obviously we were able to get uh, uh, funds from the department, uh, excuse me, from uh, DES uh, that were unspent. <clears throat> um, and I wanted to let you know sort of what was happening on the horizon with the emergency rental assistance program. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was a partnership between us and the city of Tucson. You know, the city of Tucson for, for the longest time hasn't really done, you know, uh, rent and utility assistance. You know, that, that has always been something that we've been doing over the last 30 years. So we're transitioning the program over directly to us, which um, I think we are going to have an opportunity to streamline the process for, for folks. Uh, uh, and also to ensure that this program continues, uh, we're going to be asking the Department of uh, Economic Security for an additional $30 million of rent and utility assistance that, that they still haven't spent in their second allocation from uh, the uh, emergency rental assistance program. And, and I feel very uh, um, excited about that because, you know, the, the folks at the Community Workforce Development Department have had their metal tested time and time again, and they've been there for the community. Uh, and and they, this is a, a no-fail program for, for our department. We will ensure that as long as there is money available, we will get it out to the community as urgently as possible. But the one thing that, that, you know, we wanted to check in with our, our folks to see how morale was within the department. Most recently, we did a survey with our uh, staff, and, and I'm pleased to report that the survey found that, that there's really high engagement within the department. <clears throat> and what I was surprised about, because I, I really wanted to make sure that this wasn't the case, that uh, employee uh, burnout is really low. Um, at, at this point, it's it's there, but but it's low. It's it's manageable, uh, and the biggest thing that, that our employees ask moving forward with, with the big ask that we're having on them is is professional development. <clears throat> so we're starting off with uh, trauma informed care for for our staff. So we're going to be rolling that out within the next month or so, um, and we continue to build leaders within the department, and that sort of caused uh, you know I guess you could call it a champagne problem within our department that um, we, you know we we've uh, had a lot of internal promotions. So so we have some openings on on the, the front. End, but uh, I'm so proud of, of the folks who show really that heart and urgency and, and wanting to be there, being able to move into leadership roles within the department. So over over the next year, you know, the, the things that we're looking for as a part of our strategic plan is uh, the same thing, client centrism and, and what's best for uh, the people that we serve, not, not what's best for us, not what is easy for us, it's what's easy for them. So we're looking to bring our uh, services directly into rural communities like Ajo, Catalina, Three Points. Uh, you know, we already have um, uh, permanent staff uh, co-located at the Saurita Food Bank who, who can enroll folks into our workforce programs, rent and utility assistance. So it, it's an effort to, to be there for folks. Uh, something I'm additionally even more proud about is uh, the resource fairs that we've been doing. So uh, most recently we had a resource fair at Freedom Park and, and more than 1,200 people showed up. And we're going to keep that momentum going throughout the community and, and go where, wherever it is needed. And I mentioned earlier that you know the, the EELS program really has revolutionized how we're doing things. So, so 
that is sort of the, the proving ground for how we are doing uh, this work moving forward. So we're going to be rolling that out into other divisions, be it uh, workforce development, be it uh, homeless services of the navigator model. And instead of it being, you know, I just specialize in one thing, it's, it's I have access uh, and resources uh, to be able to provide uh, folks uh, holistic services, not, not just one service. Um, and again, you know, we, we want to expand our brand, you know, from, you know, brick and mortar, one-stop system. You know, if you've heard of the brand of, of one-stop, you know, it, that is <clears throat> almost a perfect model, right? I mean, we, we want things to be one-stop and easy, but expanding that beyond just workforce into all the services that, that we offer into a holistic model. Um, and I'm uh, really looking forward to the strategic partnerships that we're going to be growing in the community, uh, specifically with uh, uh, JobPath and JTED, you know, enrolling students to get them into STEM programs and and also partnering with uh, um, uh, Pima County Transportation to get folks into career pathways that, that result in, in a family living wage. <clears throat> and the thing that I'm most proud about and most excited about coming up in the next month is uh, something that, that I think will, will turn us and keep us leaders uh, in, in this work, which is uh, the creation of uh, a digital one-stop. <clears throat> so uh, we've been working with uh, IT and procurement to identify a solution that is uh, sort of all-encompassing. So somebody who lives in Ajo or uh, Sarita can apply for services online holistically, not just workforce services, not just rental assistance, but, but it can sort of tease out the, the services that are needed. Uh, we can do uh, some of our employability skills courses on online as well. Um, and then what I think it, the additional thing it's going to bring us to is uh, data and real-time uh, understanding of what's going on within our system. So we can make real-time decisions, sort of see what, what our real-time outcomes are. So, you know, that's going to be rolling out within the next couple months. You know, it, we are really um, changing all of our processes around what, what the new system looks like. And, and we actually got a grant from the Department of Labor, one of the few demonstration sites, to sort of begin to roll out one of these systems. So I'm really hoping that we're going to be a leader. We can figure this out so, so that delivery, you know, across the country is made easier by the, the, the exploratory work that we're doing for... Uh, Pima County. So I, I hope, you know, I, I, I'm uh, on a daily basis humbled by the, the work and heart that, that goes into everybody at the community, Pima County Community and Workforce Development Department. So uh, uh, I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dan. Any questions? Um, Chair Bronson, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say how impressed I am that you've been able to put so many departments together that on paper don't seem to flow very well yeah. and um, over the last like since I've been on the board when you sort of became the director of this umbrella of different programs how they've really you've been able to weave them really well together and I think the um, I've had an opportunity to have two meetings with you we're gonna go do a couple more cruise arounds um, sure. in some of your different uh, departments to be able to thank personally the staff that is working so hard. But I also thought it was great that you sent out a survey and asked your employees, so you're not sitting in an office somewhere trying to figure out you know, if there's a problem that needs to be fixed, and you're asking what the problems are. And um, I don't know if other departments are doing that, but you're the first one that's mentioned it, and I think that it's um, a really positive step for the employees, I appreciate that. Thank you, Supervisor so Grava. And, and we're looking forward to having you at our trauma-informed care uh, uh, yeah. the training. So no, I we'll, know. I'm we'll, excited about that. We'll loop yeah. you into that. Thank yeah, you. great. That means a lot. Madam Chair. Supervisor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, throughout the coming fiscal year, uh, if we could get updates on the rollout of the customer management data system, uh, that, that would be really helpful. And, and also your expansion of the navigator model. Uh, that, that would be interesting to me as well. And then I just wanted to share with you, uh, because your department has uh, been leading the charge in terms of the rollout of our early childhood education program, that uh, my staff and I, along with a member of your team, were able to tour three facilities in our district last week. And at the first facility, we were joined by the superintendent of the amphitheater uh, public school district. He told us that because of the county's support, uh, with the expansion that they're planning for next year, 
uh, they will be able, starting next year, to be serving as many kids that equal to half a kindergarten cohort. That's great. And that is extraordinary. Absolutely. And I think we're going to be continuing to hear those kinds of uh, promising developments with all of our partners in both the school districts and, and the nonprofit sectors. So just wanted to, to share that with you. Chair Bronson, Supervisor Scott, absolutely we'll, we will bring that out. And, and uh, thank you for sharing that. And I, I'd like to thank, you know, she, she's here today, uh, Jen Darland, who's our Deputy Director, who um, is overseeing the, the, the PEEPS program, but, but also Nicole Fife and, and Nicole Scott. I mean, it's, um, when I think about this time last year, you know, it was uh, the PEEPS program and the EELS program. And, uh, you know, in all of my time with the county, I, I don't think I've ever seen two programs roll out more smoothly and, and more professionally. And, and I, that really has to do with uh, how smart and how dedicated, you know, folks like Andy Flagg and, and Jen Darland are. Thank you. All right, any more questions? All right. Well, thank you. And let's thank move you. on to health services. Dr. Carl. Good morning, uh, Chair Bronson, Superintendent, Administrator Lesser. I, I'm looking forward to giving you our update. I recently passed my two-year anniversary with the privilege of being the Director of the Public Health Department. I want to talk to you a little bit about our mission, what we've been doing, what our challenges are, what opportunities exist. I do want to take this opportunity, however, to thank the other departments in the audience. Many of them have worked closely with us over the last year, have helped guide us, have given us opportunities to be in the community with them, with the recognition as we go into the next year that there are multiple faceted ways that we can continue to work together. Um, as you know, my deputy moved to natural resource, so I'm very interested in taking taking over parks and recs. Not, not really, but I'm <laughs> working closely with them. So let me talk to you briefly about what public health does. So we do have a, we have a mission, and that mission is to create a healthy community, full stop. That's what it's about. We believe if we create a healthy community, we will give more opportunity for businesses, for schools, for families, for communities. We will be able to have a more equitable community with where people will want to move to, will want to start small businesses, and can be reassured that their public health is protected. I want to talk briefly about what services we provide. Many of you are familiar with COVID. I'll talk briefly about COVID later. But we do do things besides COVID. We do some. <coughs> services that are mandated. Most of these are mandated through Arizona State statute. They include our TB, which you know runs as a clinic. They include our immunizations. They include our sexual health, which you can parlay into family planning and sexually transmitted diseases. That's a whole potpourri of different diseases that we do. In addition, we are mandated to do chefs, which is food safety and vital records. However, in addition to that, we do provide other services. Those are spring from these mandated services, and they include epidemiological disease, investigation, in interaction with the community, they include early sentinel awareness so that we know if there's going to be a problem in the community with a disease. And we also have extended into community health engagement. That includes the things that many of you are familiar with. Tobacco, uh, work with the early childhood education, physical activity, safe living, mental health and substance abuse, which we know are on the minds of many people in the community. Uh, to share with you, we have zip codes where we are seeing more than one overdose a day. Uh, that those don't all result in death, about 20% do, but we have a significant problem with overdose and substance abuse and with mental health, as we all know. Uh, we also do a focus on data aggregation and analytics. This is to provide us with early sentinel awareness and enable us to know what diseases are happening in the community. I want to read, because I don't remember all these numbers, I want to read some service delivery numbers. On the last year up till now, so this current fiscal year, over 100,000 vital records have been produced. Over 30,000 unique clinical patients have been seen. 10,000 WIC participants per month, and I want to take the opportunity to thank our WIC staff. They won two state awards, the only department in the country, uh, in the state that has done that in the last year. 40,000 community members served by our health out outreach, over 10,000 NARC 
Narcan kits. As far as chefs goes, we've done over 17,000 inspections um, with 8,300 food, aquatic, or lodging facilities being monitored. Lots of food service staff changed in over 30 community events with over 1,000 attendees. So as you can see, we've had pretty significant successes in terms of monitoring widgets, counting what we've done. Have we had successes beyond that really on a more qualitative way? As you know, we have done significant community engagement with the schools, with businesses, with Tucson restaurants, with churches, with community-based organizations. We've been taking the opportunity of COVID to be able to really leverage that and move forward. We've been recently asked to be a part of the Big City Health Coalition. There are 35 cities and or jurisdictions in the country. The primary ones that we, you would know are LA, New York, Chicago. Tucson was recently asked to join uh, through Pima County, and so we are now a member of that. We do have an EIS, an epidemiology officer, coming in through CDC. It's the first time the county has ever had that. We're the only small county in the country besides Columbus, Ohio, that was able to have that happen in the last year. We have had multiple awards. Uh, I always say we're a national award-winning organization. We actually got notified of two awards yesterday for one for innovate, both for innovation through the National Association of City and County. The reason why that's important is that when people think of what is a good county, what is a healthy county, I want them and we all want them to think of Pima County and to understand that we are able to deliver on what we say we are going to do. As far as other successes, we did initiate PrEP. Uh, this is prevention for HIV. We're the first county in the state to do that. We've, been, we've presented at national conferences on this already. As you know, we have some major grants, over $20 million in competitive awards in the last uh, probably 18 months now. And our COVID response, and I don't, I don't want to focus on that. As you know, we have done a good job. COVID is the third cause of mortality in our county, even though in the state it is the first cause. Cancer and coronary disease are, are still number one and two. What that means is that we had less deaths than other counties experienced, probably, and I believe, due to our COVID response. Our goals for 23, continue to engage, continue to engage with schools, with businesses, with churches, with the community, create a healthy, resilient, thriving community, ensure that we have an epidemiological infrastructure and service that can meet that need for early sentinel awareness. What that means, I'll give you a very example. Last year, you may be aware we had a West Nile, really epidemic, a very significant spike. We want to know about that early. We want to know where that's happening. We want to know what we should do to mitigate that. And having better data allows us to do that. Our challenges, like uh, I heard yesterday when I listened in, as well as the, today, remain uh, consistent with other departments related to recruiting and retaining qualified staff. However, we have had a significant change in the last four months. Our turnover rate, we used to call it our revolving door, has decreased from 31% to 7.85%. Uh, that is due to many things, uh, including I think that there's just a little lift in the pandemic and people have some breathing room. We've added a 31 net new staff in the last six months because of that, where our hires by month average are 10. So we continue to believe that we will be able to fill our positions. As you know, we are not only competing with other counties here, we are competing nationally because many other public health departments are letting people live wherever they want and still provide their services. As far as as our other challenges, we do have public health fatigue. The community has public health fatigue. And we are trying to come up with ways to make sure we can address that. Obviously, we have that in our staff. We have EAP on site once a month. They have done seven sessions in groups. We have EAP available for individuals. Today, in fact, EAP is happening. All the individual spots are filled. That's given us this recognition of how much we need to pay attention to. We also have in, uh, embarked on a really exciting initiative with JTED, where we will be training people for MAs, medical assistant jobs. They are are needed throughout the country, the county, the country, but they're definitely needed with us. So starting in uh, January, we will be working with them. It started now, but the first group will go through then. We are also looking at, uh, at our environmental health services people. Our EHS-1s uh, require a high school degree and or an equivalent. We have had a revolving door there. We will be working with JTIT to develop a similar program. We have internships with multiple public health institutions. In the past two years, we've had five full-time 
time. People come to work with us who were initially interns. We have relationships with Emory, with Maryland, as well as Arizona and the other schools here to make sure that we can develop a pipeline, once again, not only for us, but for healthcare in the system. So. To close, there's lots of things we can do. There's lots of things we still need to pay attention to. The concept of non-communicable disease, that's like the cancer, the hypertension. Those are really critical parts. When we look at what affects mortality, interestingly enough, the number one impact on mortality is tobacco which is hard to believe in 2022. Eight, yeah, 18% of our population still smokes. So if we can just decrease that a little, we can increase life expectancy and because of the impact on coronary disease and lung cancer. So healthy lives are productive lives. I believe that the health, public health department serves a role to make sure that we can work together to improve the health of the community. I would also caution you that this is not a fast fix may have been a little fax with COVID. We got a vaccine out, we did it. To move us to one of the healthiest counties in America, which is where I would like us to be, is a 10-year journey. Um, I'd like to restart the clock after the last two years, but I don't think I should. I think I need to keep going. But we are really trying to develop a metric and a way to do that. So, and with that, I can take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Madam Chair. Supervisor. To, to pick up, Dr. Cullen, uh, where you finished, uh, I wanted to talk about some of the work that uh, community outreach prevention and education does uh, because, a, a, as you alluded to, a, a American healthcare is often more reactive than preventive. And I'm really drawn to this sentence in the function description of community outreach prevention and education. This division is the spearhead of the equity and health literacy efforts of the department and the primary focus and guiding principle of this division and all activities conducted in these programs. Major areas of focus include child development and nutrition, tobacco and chronic disease prevention, mental health and substance abuse mitigation and school-based activity programs. Uh, I'm always going to be very interested, and I'm sure the rest of the board will be too, in, in the uh, work that is being done uh, in, in that area uh, so we can uh, move towards that goal of being one of the most healthy counties uh, in the country and being more preventive and less reactive. Yes, Supervisor Scott, members of the board. We have a real commitment that health occurs outside the four walls of any clinics and any hospitals, and the social determinants of health are critical factors that impact that. We have a large contingency, and I didn't talk about this, of community health workers with the belief that they are the eyes and ears, not of us, but of the community even though they work with us and for us, and that they are the ways that we can impact and change behavior and also get early awareness of what is going on. We have some recent success stories. Mayor Tesso in South Tucson was increasingly discouraged, as I think the rest of us were, with the vaccination rates that we had in South Tucson. So working with uh, the city of Tucson, other CBOs, as well as our vaccine equity group, we raised their vaccine rate to over 60%. They had been below 40% for a very, very long time. Remember, it's a small area, but the fact that we were able to do that in that one area is proven to us that with enough effort, we will be able to impact in every community. We drive our data at a census track level with the belief that that's important. Thank you. And also wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to talk about any recommendations that may be coming to the board as the result of the uh, community health needs assessment. Yeah, uh, thank you, Supervisor Scott, members of the board. So the community health needs assessment was just uh, published. Uh, it will be coming out. Uh, it will be followed by a CHIP, a community health improvement plan. The CHANA, which was done in conjunction with the healthcare facilities with Banner and Tucson Medical Center, really with the lead, but the tribes at the table, CBOs at the table, came up with four major 
other areas of concern. These will not be surprising to anyone. Mental health, substance abuse, mental health depression, substance abuse, access to care, and social determinants of health. So the way we will move forward now is to establish this CHIP, Community Health uh, Improvement Plan, which will be run by the county, however, with involvement of the CBOs and the health care systems to respond and develop appropriate ways to interact with those. I'll pick on or I'll highlight substance abuse right now. We know that opioids, like I talked about, are a major issue in the community. We've been working with CDC. We've looked at what are best practices. The CDC has proposed 10 best practices for every community. We have added three and then a communication part of it. So really a 14 level plan to try to address and implement what are best practices. And we're in the process of developing a work plan. Now that will be vetted through the chip itself, but that work was happening once we realized that Chennai was going to say substance abuse was a major problem. It shouldn't surprise you, behavioral health and substance abuse have come up repeatedly. Housing comes up repeatedly when we survey, but it didn't come up with the Chennai. But we know housing security is also a huge issue, which is one reason we work with Dan's department. Thank and then you. one other uh, uh, question is if you could speak to how Part, uh, participating in the public health accreditation process uh, uh, is, is helpful uh, to the uh, uh, professional learning uh, of everybody in your team. Yeah, th thank you for that question too. Sorry I didn't mention these things, Supervisor no, Scott, good, good. members so of the much board. In writing. It's great. So our FAB, uh, public health accreditation process, we actually went round and round. We are accredited whether we should re-accredit. The reality is the accreditation process in public health as well as for anyone else can be used effectively to be transformative to an organization and that is how we are using it. It gives us an opportunity to engage in performance and quality improvement, to put that in place to reevaluate what we are doing. The FAB has 12 different areas. It's going to change next year, but we are in the process of submitting our application. It will go in by June. I would be surprised uh, if we didn't get reaccredited. I'm sure there will be some findings, but I may take that opportun this opportunity to uh, also say we've had recent uh, reviews of our TB program, our lab program, and we have had no findings, and our WIC program, and we have had no findings. So the FAB gives us an opportunity to say to the community, you can trust us. We are accredited by a national body. It's not just ourselves reviewing ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor. So um, I know that a, the um, county health department has a lot of funding, federal, state, there's a lot of grant funding. Um, I know that you know we're going to be looking at continuing a lot of these programs that are currently grant funded. So as we get to that point, I'm assuming that we'll hear as a board the kind of um, financial support that we're going to have to shift to county health in order to make sure that those programs continue. Yeah. If um, we don't get funded, or if you know some wonderful miraculous funding comes from the feds, which we're not sure about, you know. Yeah. Thank you, know. Supervisor Grijalva, members of the board. So right now, this year, as we go into 22, I was just looking at my card that 64% of our funding will be grant funding. Um, so 36% will be health funding. Now, we believe we will be able to hopefully get some no-cost extensions on some of these grants. Remember, the grants came t -t 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 really rapidly. Um, many of these grants, however, are competitive grants. They were not non-competitive, which said, okay, Pima County, you're going to get this much money. Instead, they were grants that we applied for. We, uh, by working with GMI, uh, are aware of other grants that are out there, and so we are always have an eye to the future of how will we continue to be able to sustain these activities. However, at the same time, I think it is important that the board, uh, I'm gonna, that, that for us, we show you that these grants have made a difference. Right? Nobody wants to continue funding anything if it's not going to have an impact on health. At least I don't want to do that. And so part of what we're doing with all our grants is having an evaluation component to it where we will be able to say this grant touched this many of lives. It may be a qualitative assessment of the impact. But the concern that there may be a cliff when uh, the significant amount of money that came in right. specifically for public health ends, uh, the belief is that that cliff will probably be uh, 
in 24. There was a belief it was gonna be in 23. We've had the indication that two of our grants will be able to have a no-cost extension. Okay, and, and, and I think the other thing is that some of these grants are restrictive in what they want. I mean, they're they're very targeted is to the certain area of town or, you know, certain zip code. And, and so if you see good results in some of these areas, you want to make sure that we have the capacity. So um, I know having run programs with grants that are like, we want you to address right. this one zip code and this one little neighborhood, and you see really positive results. Those are things that we mm -hmm. want to continue to expand upon, especially since if we've learned nothing from COVID, it was these areas of our community that are really underserved. Um, and so being able to get out to those communities to provide you know, vaccination and testing, we want to be able to continue that to offer other supports that um, I know that the health department offers. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any further questions? All right, then let's move on to library district. Good morning, Chair Bronson and members of the board. Thank you for um, letting me have this time to talk to you about my favorite thing, which is public libraries. Um, what our, apartment do, our department does well, in your um, information that you got, our statement is Pima County Libraries provides residents with free and equitable access to the information resources needed for full participation in the community and for the enrichment of individual lives. And what that really means is that we provide um, for the next steps that people are taking throughout their lives from, from birth and, and until the oldest in our communities. We have um, information for parents on early childhood development and access to story times, homework help for children and teens, GED preparation, English as a second language, citizenship classes, job help, career online high schools for um, folks who may have missed out on the opportunity of getting their diploma can get that through the library as well. Um, we help people uh, managing or accessing the digital, digital world. And of course, referral to not only resources within, within the county, but um, with other uh, agencies as well. And of course, um, recreation. People want to read and see movies and all of the things that we have to author, offer. Um, libraries are trusted organizations in the community, which um, gives us the opportunity to make a lot of great connections. Uh, recently, Susan Benton from the Urban Libraries Council said that um, more than any other department or agency, public libraries are really adept at breaking down old silo walls and creating cross-boundary relationships. And we've really been able to do that within the county. We've had long time relationship with the health department, community workforce development, um, lots of our departments that we work with. Um, one thing that we helped during the pandemic was to help set up the uh, COVID helpline so people knew how to register for uh, COVID vaccines. We helped to distribute thousands of COVID kits for the health department. And um, one of the other things that we do that you might not think of is that the library is really a touch point for those who are new to our communities, especially immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. Um, we also, during the pandemic, were able to partner with local groups like the Community uh, Food Bank as well as local school districts to distribute more than 200,000 boxes of food and snacks within our community. Uh, because of our 27 library locations. Um, we are currently working with the county IT department to help address the broadband connectivity response in our community because we know that the pandemic also shone a light on the fact that so many people in our community either have no um, internet access, may not have a device to connect to <laughs> if they did have the access, or um, know how to use them. So the library is able to help with all of those kinds of things. We're good at helping find solutions. Um, we pivoted to online programs, so things like um, our Ready Set School, which is to help uh, children get ready for um, kindergarten, 
uh, other online programs. We also started doing curbside service for book delivery, copying, faxing, grab and go crafts for kids. And then we started a thing that was new to us, which is library book lock lockers, so that people can have access to books that they reserve 24 seven. We have those at about six locations now where we're gonna be adding those to all of our li library locations over time. Some uh, exciting things that happened to us uh, or with us in the past two years during this pandemic time is that we were able to open two new library facilities. So the W.N. Gibson Esmond Station Library in the Vale area. We also opened uh, the new Sabarita Library. And we renamed two of our libraries, the Richard Elias Mission Library and the Frank De La Cruz El Pueblo Library. And thanks to all of you for supporting our um, removal of uh, fines. That removed big barriers for people in our community who could not afford to pay library fines when they were returning books late. Um, our biggest challenges, though, have been uh, reopening our 27 locations because we have um, had experienced high number of vacancies. And um, that was going on a little bit before um, COVID began because um, baby boomers are retiring and there are library positions available all across the nation. But it um, became a little more difficult during pandemic because we didn't hire for, for some time. So we are behind in our hiring right now and we're working on that. Uh, other things that we're struggling with um, in terms of inflation are the formats that we provide materials in. So for one particular t book title, we might have it in regular print, large print, um, electronic format, mat, uh, sometimes up to five different formats, large print, all of those. And then um, more streaming content is available for us now too. So all of those things are costing more. And another thing that we're facing are security issues. As people in the um, communities are having difficulty experiencing homelessness, um, drug addiction, all of those things happen in our libraries as well. And so our staff are having to deal with um, difficult situations. So we've been happy to work with John Stuckey in getting our um, security beefed up as they're looking for um, people to do security and jobs as well. Some of our goals for the uh, coming year, a big one is determining what's the path forward for libraries. We know that people's lives changed during COVID and they're using us a little differently. Those people who do have access have taken great advantage of all of our electronic resources, but they aren't necessarily coming into our buildings. And so we're gonna be spending this next year in figuring out exactly what are the services that people really are looking for from us. Um, whether that be hours, programs, events. We're thinking that we probably will have to do more services outside of our libraries as well, which we are situated now for. We have three um, library vans that are equipped with Wi-Fi, so we'll be able to take more services out into the community. And we're also having a new project for our um, farthest out libraries, Aravaca and Ajo will be uh, recipients of um, equipment for telemedicine so that folks who can't get to their doctors may be able to do that through equipment at the library. Um, we have, um, we need to continue to increase the number of library, <laughs> library staff that we have on if we're gonna keep our 27 locations open. So we're working really hard on recruitment, but also on retention. And um, we know that it's not the bricks and mortar or even the materials we provide, but the bright and talented professional staff who make the library integral, integral to the community. And we need to make sure that we can keep them. Um, also, uh, our staff are really important for relationships because that's what a lot of it, libraries are about, especially for young people. It's been shown that for a young person to be successful, all they need is one adult in their life who cares about them. And a lot of times that ends up being someone that works with them in the library. We are continuing to work with partners this year with school districts, especially we want to beef up collaborations because we know that kids have this educational gap that they'll be working on. We also are continuing to work with the Tohono O'odham and Pascua Yaqui tribes to support needs of um, the people on the nations. And we're continuing to look at all that we do with a diversity of equity and inclusion. 
with our regard to policies, practices, and um, we do have something called restorative practices for youth, which is a way for youth, if they've gotten in trouble at the library in the past, they would have been suspended. They um, can figure out what is a, something that they can do so that they can remain in the library and use the library's resources. Um, we're finding more and more opportunities to partner with other departments, especially with regard to educational catch-up, workforce development, and eviction prevention. And of course, um, digital equity is always on our mind as well. And libraries, I think, are integral in creating and maintaining an equitable and just, just society. And one of, as one of the largest public-facing departments, we have the opportunity and the responsibility to shine a light on all the work that Pima County does. With our many locations and community connections, libraries are um, uniquely situated to facilitate access to information, but also of conveners of conversation on cr critical community issues. We look forward to a year of renewed community connections and thank you for your support of libraries, literacy, and lifelong learning. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Madam Chair. Supervisor. Thank you. Ms. Mathewson, uh, thank you for being here today, not only because of your fulsome presentation and the focus on relationships and libraries as community hubs, uh, but you've also helped me to reduce uh, the list of people who I've only met on virtual platforms. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about what you listed as the sixth uh, major departmental issue uh, for the County Free Library, which is uh, due to the pandemic, library was unable to fully was unable to fully implement the library community services program. And I know we have a description a function description of the library community services, but I just wanted to um, uh, hear from you when that program, when library community services is um, uh, up and running, fully implemented, uh, what, what, what can our community expect from that? Thank you for asking that question, Supervisor Scott. Um, I think that what we're looking at is how we um, connect with the community in different ways than we are now. So um, that program would be a deputy director who's focusing specifically on outreach into the community. So it would give us the opportunity of um, spreading our services outside of our buildings into communities that might not have a library or in areas where they have difficulty um, getting to the library. The other thing that we can do, as I mentioned, collaborating with schools. What we have been able to do in the past is to go on the nights when they invite um, parents in for um, resources and then we can um, talk to them about getting a library card, share with them the resources that are available. So all of those things that could happen outside of our library that then let people know um, what's available to them. If we could get updates uh, on that program and also uh, if, if you need assistance and support in terms of getting the word out uh, in, in our districts about that program, that would be terrific. Absolutely. Thank I'd be you. happy to Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Chair Supervisor. Bob. Well, thank you for um, sort of highlighting all of the different programs that the library has been a part of. You also had snack distribution yes. and food distribution. Um, and so, you know, as a wife, daughter, and sister to librarians, librarian, libraries are very important in our family and in our community. And I think that it's great that you not only give us this update, but you send us communications monthly to let us know all of the things that are happening. And if you haven't had a chance to sit in on the library advisory meetings, they're really just, they give you such a um, overall, um, review of all of the different things that the library touches throughout our community and so I'm glad that you're looking at how to reimagine how to access um, and provide access to people because things are different but um, I do think that libraries are an integral part of making sure that we keep our people connected so thank, thank you. you all right any further questions and Amber thank you um, I'm definitely going to be using your electronic services Excellent. <laughs> All right. Um, medical examiner is next. Um, 
Madam Chair, members of the board, um, I'm Greg Hess. I'm a forensic pathologist and chief medical examiner f here in Pima County. The medical examiner's office, to sum it up, essentially does two things. We certify deaths that um, fall under the jurisdiction of the medical examiner's office, and we administrate the indigent internment program for Pima County. Um, what does that look like? Uh, in 2021, there was uh, about 14,000 registered deaths in Pima County. About 30% of those, or a little bit over 4,000, were uh, reported to us. Uh, we certified about 20% of um, that total mortality um, numbers, and um, that, in a, in a nutshell, is, is what we do, and we represent all that in an annual report once a year that talks about all the different cause of death categories that um, are reported to us and we certify. Um, most people that die in Pima County don't have anything to do with the medical examiner's office. They die as the result of some natural medical condition that they're being followed by a provider in the community, and they die as a result of that condition, and you know, we're not necessarily involved. For the indigent internment program, um, <clears throat> that turns out to be about 5% of total mortality in the population at least gets referred to that program. Those are people who, so in general, next of kin is responsible for the final arrangements of a, their loved one. Um, sometimes um, next of kin doesn't have the finances to do that and the county may step in. Sometimes we can't find next of kin to come forward to make arrangements. Or sometimes next of kin abandons the decedent. All those may fall under that program. Or sometimes we don't know who the decedent is and therefore we don't have an opportunity to find next of kin for them. So about 60% of all those applications end up being uh, approved, which is about 400 people a year, and we run that program uh, where to put people and um, how they're uh, interred and all those different things. We also serve uh, through different agreements to be medical examiner for other counties. Uh, three of them are through intergovernmental agreements that the board approves. That's uh, Cochise, Graham, and, and La Paz. And then Santa Cruz County is on a fee-for-service basis from our fee ordinance. And then we do kind of a la carte fee-for-service work with a, a variety of other counties as necessary or uh, Native American reservations. All of that work is represented, at least in terms of a budget presentation, on the revenue uh, numbers for the office. Um, what's been on our radar recently is a facility. Um, everything we do currently is um, basically constrained by the building that we're in, and we're sort of maxed out and have been for some time. And I know that that facility has come up um, in front of the board too, and we have positive movement on that, which is fantastic. That said, I don't have any other prepared comments, but I'd be happy to take any questions that people might have. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, any questions? Madam Chair. Supervisor. Dr. Hess, uh, thank you for being here today. And uh, just like with Ms. Matthewson, it's nice to uh, see you in person. Could you speak to the uh, new uh, program manager unclassified position that is going to fulfill the role of a forensic epidemiologist and, and how the county may benefit from the data that that, that uh, position is going to put together? Sure, so that basically represents the FTE that we added in comparison to previous years. Um, the, the role of a forensic epidemiologist in our office is to do more than we've been doing in the past. So historically, everything that we do is represented in that static annual report that we put out once a year. And our epidemiologist is the one that actually did the report this year other than myself, because I, I was the epidemiologist uh, for the office, but I'm not one, by the way, um, in the past. So that's been very helpful, and then we're going to dashboard um, information beginning in 2022 that we haven't before for people to see in more real time. What does that mean? That means using tools like data and analytics use uh, in Power BI to um, demonstrate uh, the prevalence of certain deaths that people are interested in rather than just once a year as a retrospective look. So there's a lot of interest in um, multiple different kinds of deaths and special interest groups that we certify. So that might be overdose deaths, that might be suicides, um, that might be infant deaths, all that the, the county and the state has uh, death fatality review teams for. 
um, things like in custody deaths, officer involved, um, domestic violence, uh, veterans, uh, homeless, um, all these you know, things that we chronically get um, public information requests for or even out other county departments track closely. So all that's gonna run through that position uh, because we wouldn't have the bandwidth to do it without somebody trained to run numbers like that. And how, and are we already making all of the other entities within and outside the county that may be interested in that data aware of uh, the, this new position and, and, and everything it's going to do? Yeah, so Madam Chair, Supervisor uh, Scott, the, um, we have, uh, it's not live in real time yet because we have to go through the process and work through the other departments to help us, principally data and analytics and uh, information technology. Initially, we want to make it available on the county intranet, and then there's no reason why it couldn't be public facing. And so that's kind of our ultimate goal, is to have that for people to reference um, rather than necessarily have to call, file some kind of public information request. There's nothing protected about the information. We've just never had the bandwidth to demonstrate it for people to essentially view and uh, manipulate. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Hess. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much, doctor. And let's move on to Pima Animal Care. Good morning, <clears throat> excuse me. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Monica Dangler. I'm the director at Pima Animal Care Center. Um, as you know, Pima Animal Care Center provides services to an area that's 9,000 square miles and consists of unincorporated Pima County, the cities of Tucson, South Tucson, uh, the town of Oro Valley, and the Pascayaki Pasca tribe. PAC has 22 animal protection officers to provide animal control services to this area and calls are prioritized uh, for public safety. PAC is a nationally recognized animal shelter leading the country in community-centered shelter services. Pima Animal Care Center operates a community-centric model of animal sheltering as a solution to an overburdened system and to, the support, and to support the health of the community. We know pets make a positive impact on our physical and mental health, um, and this way of business involves keeping pets with their uh, families and in the community um, where they're loved, as well as providing our communities the support and resources they need to keep their families together. Over the last nine months, PAC's Pet Support Center uh, assisted approximately 2,949 families um, to keep their pets opposed to coming to the shelter. An additional 2,300 found pets were able to be kept safe uh, with by their finders and then either reunited or rehomed within their community. And finally, we were able to assist with self-supported self rehoming to more than 500 pets, resulting in them avoiding the shelter altogether which reduces the stress on the people and the pets. Uh, it helps maintain the human-animal bond, and it begins growing a safety, net foster, a safety net for community members supporting community members. In addition to involving the community and being part of the solution, PAC also supports our community with resources. This last fiscal year, PAC has held two free mega spay-neuter community cat clinics where more than 1,100 community cats were sterilized, vaccinated, and microchipped. PAC has also hosted seven mega vaccination clinics, vaccinating and microchipping more than 2,800 uh, pets in Pima County. Uh, PAC continue to distribute pet food, supplies, uh, human hygiene and household goods to families in vulnerable communities. These uh, mega clinics and distribution events are made possible through grant funding um, and donations. In addition to these clinics, Pima County funds more than $500,000 in subsidized spay neuter services for community cats and owned pets uh, through contracted vendors. PAC is excited to be able to expand our reach in FY2324 with the addition of an outreach vehicle that will help us reach uh, more rural areas like Ajo, uh, Aravaca, and Three Points. This fiscal year, PAC has seen its largest intake numbers since the beginning of COVID, 
More than 1,600, sorry, 16,800 pets have already entered the shelter system, and we have uh, continually operated in code red status, which means uh, we have available pets being housed in non-public kennels. Uh, despite this challenge, PAC has been able to maintain a 92.28% live release rate uh, due to the community support. As PAC looks forward, we anticipate operating at capacity through 2022, as we've seen the reason for surrender due to financial reasons increase by 20% compared to 2019. The last year, um, PAC has been able to really lean into being a true community resource where people and pets are kept together. While we're seeing an uptick in shelter census, we expect long-term that the community-centric model of animal sheltering will result in a decrease in animals needing to be housed in the shelter. Our goal is to be a resource to those sick and injured pets, pets needing special attention to be placed in behaviorally compatible homes and for those people who are experiencing temporary crisis and want to keep their pets. Um, that is all for me, so thank you, and uh, I'm open for questions. Will you have, don't you have an event coming up Friday? Of course, yes, we've got our first large, super fun event uh, this Friday, Howling at the Moon. There's gonna be a bouncy house, food vendors, you name it, um, and we're kind of celebrating all of those events that we didn't have for the last two years. Very good. Yeah. And this I normally don't like show and tell, but I was hoping you would bring. Had I known, I totally would have brought a basket full of kittens. <laughs> Are there any questions? Madam Chair. Supervisor. Uh, Ms. Dengler, thank you for your presentation and thank you for all the detail you put in the uh, budget book about the impacts of the pandemic on, on PAC. I don't know that a lot of people in our community uh, consider uh, how significantly uh, PAC has and, and our animal community as a whole has been impacted by the pandemic, but uh, it is significant and I appreciate you illustrating it in such detail. With regard to detail, I would appreciate it if I could get some follow-up from you uh, and county administration, perhaps mm -hmm. finance, with regard to um, the data in the um, donations line uh, that is also reflected in the other special revenue fund uh, line because it's, it's confusing to me. It looks like we went from uh, uh, having a significant number of donations in 2020, 2021 to zero uh, in the current year and now being in, in some kind of a, a deficit. And I realize there's always a story behind the numbers, but the way I'm looking at the numbers, uh, both in that, that program, the donations program, and then also the other special revenue fund, if we could get some more uh, detail to help flesh out the story behind the numbers, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely, I think I'm gonna have to refer to a finance person to look at that. I'm, I'm guessing it has something to do with um, the, our uh, revenue fund. We were operating on separate bureaus um, and we've closed out a bureau and moved it into another uh, for the different monies that we come in through bequests. And we found that yeah. with some of the other uh, departments that have, that have been here before is that uh, it, it, it's clear to the people who work with the numbers, but absent some kind of narrative within the uh, within the budget book, uh, you're you're not entirely clear as a as a layman. For sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Let's move on to capital projects. Good morning, Chair Bronson, Supervisors. My name is Nancy Cole, so I'm the Director of the Capital Program Office, and um, I think at this point I've met most of you, but I'm still in my first year with the Capital Program Office. It is my 10th year as managing project management and oversight for the Capital Program, but we were previously located within. I've never had someone tell me I'm not speaking loud enough. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> so this is actually my 10th year um, as the manager of this office uh, prior to it being pulled out as a separate um, 
department. And that has been very important for us to do because we're reflecting the fact that the capital program is countywide and not just public works, even though I am still located within the public works umbrella. We are servicing all of the departments within Pima County and we needed to recognize that importance. Okay, our group does three major areas of work. We do long range planning, capital planning, looking at infrastructure, supporting economic development initiatives or any other uh, planning initiatives per administration. We also do metrics and oversight for the program. So we are looking at how to measure um, annual program budget expenditures, individual project expenditures and timelines to see that we're on time and on budget to the best extent possible. All right, and then we are also doing direct project management. So I have staff who deliver projects for Pima County for smaller departments, for more complex or multi-jurisdictional projects, or for things related to economic development. So what have we changed this year, this upcoming budget cycle? So one of the things we've had is we've increased our staffing level. So we're asking for 10 FTE instead of seven. We have already started with that this fiscal year. That change in staffing is directly related to taking on more scope of work. We have transferred the uh, transportation department's capital programs um, to our group. Um, not the maintenance, which is the bulk of the work that's done by the transportation funding, but the capital projects. So for example, Sunset um, I-10 to River is a project being done through our project management office. So then um, we have also taken on the role similarly for wastewater to take on some of their capital projects. And the reason we're doing this is frankly, um, the county's reoccurring issue with keeping and retaining technical staff. So by having us in a consolidated group, we can share project managers across departments easier and better resource balance to deliver these programs. Um, so that's a purposeful thing we're doing to help combat some of the issues you're seeing over and over in all of our departments. And that's especially true in technical divisions um, such as project management, which may have an engineering or construction background. I'd like to also point out that one of the larger expenses we have is now the uh, Arts Foundation contract. This was previously done through Attractions and Tourism as an outside agency. And now that's in our office because it's tied to public art. And we have the public art coordinator within our group who oversees that whole program. So that contract lives within our uh, budget as well. Uh, challenges are really Staffing for us, continuing to do that. We have lost good technical staff. We have replaced some, and now we still need to fill some of those positions. Some of those FTEs that came from wastewater came vacant. So we are um, still continuing to reach our full staff level and hope to get there by the end of the fiscal year or shortly thereafter. Do you have any questions? You've got a, you've got, um quite the load. <laughs> yes, and actually I have two parts to my presentation. I have my department, and then I have the capital improvement program, all of the projects. So this is questions for the department. Okay, department well, questions. maybe it'd be better to wait after wait. she's keep okay. giving her. Yeah, okay. So I'm happy to keep talking. Uh, so the capital improvement budget is also under our purview. Um, so we're the ones who present on that since we are the ones who are doing the metrics related to it. Okay, and so annually, we maintain a 10-year program for long range. Those are not funded projects. Those are uh, long leading um, things that are necessary for the departments to continue to function. We take that 10-year each year and go through an annual budget process that looks at both a one and five year horizon. And then we come to you each year with this annual budget that we're talking about today. So the annual budget right now that we're asking for for capital is uh, 238 million. It won't look like that in the budget book because we separate by funding source. So different departments that are funded differently will be located in different areas, but additively, that is the total. That's a little bit higher. Our five-year average is about 190 million. So that's about uh, 40 million increase. Um, 
That has mostly to do just with timing of larger projects. So we have quite a few very large projects that are scheduled for the next upcoming year. Um, and it has a little bit to do with funding sources. So we have some uh, different alternative sources such as uh, ARPA that are assisting with the very large ones. Uh, for example, the uh, Office of Medical Examiner um, next fiscal year. And so those are, you're seeing a bump in our, in our program a little bit higher than our normal average. So, um, you know, our top five projects are the Office of Medi Medical Examiner, the uh, Sunset I-10 to River, and this is just strictly by funds. Um, Wastewaters Continental Ranch, Dual Force Main, our ADG ERP system replacement, and um, transportation South Houghton Road widening. So um, you can see we have quite a lot running through as a county in general and uh, continue to move forward um, despite um, <laughs> challenges in the industry. What was the last one? South Houghton Road widening. So challenges we have, you've heard a lot of, uh, but particularly felt harsh, harshly in the construction agency. We have a um, shortage in the labor market for contractors, so that impacts their ability to deliver um, and raises costs. Um, we have uh, commodity issues. So commodities are not only expensive, but they are scarce. So we have um, issues with uh, delivery and ordering uh, commodities related to construction. And that can impact um, not just cost, but schedule, how long things take. Uh, for example, um, electrical equipment such as panels may have a five to nine month lead time. Um, when your project's supposed to be built within a year, that is really difficult um, to, to deliver in a timely manner. So those are really challenging. What we're doing to overcome some of these is looking at um, project phasing. So when we go and bid a project, we're gonna look at providing phasing opportunities so that we can reduce scope to stay within budget if needed, and then deliver remaining scope in future years with future money. We operate as a pay-as-you-go um, community as much as we can, so we need to stay within our budget for that year. It's very difficult. In some cases, we will ask for additional money when it's impossible to break that scope up. And it's not in our best interest to do that or will cost significantly more to do so. I think the other um, opportunity we're using is more alternative delivery. That allows us to um, pre-purchase uh, long lead commodity items and several departments are taking advantage of this right now. And we can also use them to help us uh, get best value, uh, right size the project, deliver it as easy as possible, or even take advantage of uh, scheduling, where we give them a larger window to deliver a smaller project so they could fit it within their schedule and give us the best price. Right, are there any particular questions on the capital program? Madam Chair? Supervisor Chris. Um, what determines a capital project? Uh, that's a great question. People ask me that all the time. So that is ruled by finance. So they, our standard response to this is if it's $100,000 or more, it counts as an asset. And therefore it is a capital asset and needs to be tracked. We do sometimes add other projects within that if it has a unusual funding source that we need to track at a higher level or if we're trying to take advantage of uh, reporting and standard tools for projects within that program based on our uh, financial system. So it's basically a dollar amount of the project? Yes, and it also is, it could be an existing asset, um, but we invest enough money to extend the lifetime of that asset significantly, then we will also count that. Are there capital. projects that are, have already taken um, place as far as a starting time uh, in the, and in the middle of the project, they are um, for some reason determined that they'll go into the capital project uh, queue, or can that happen bef after a project has already started? It can happen after it's started. It generally is something we will catch in advance. We have a charter and gate milestone process where you define projects before they're budgeted. And um, you know, once, once we know that value, you'll have to go through that process to get into the program. Have, has your department ever put a, a dollar, a total dollar amount of all the county assets? 
Um, we have, there's actually a number posted in the infrastructure plan online, um, and that number was from 2019, so it's a little out of date, but I don't recall it offhand. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, supply chain issues are really, you've got to be stressing on that one. We all, all of the departments. All right, attractions and tourism. Good morning. Good morning. Chairman Bronson, supervisors, happy to be here to talk about attractions and tourism. Happy to be out in public. Happy to be in a group. Uh, <laughs> It's been a challenging two years with COVID. Who could have foreseen a pandemic? Um, so we have changed into a def defensive position, working on rebuilding what we had with a robust tourism, restaurant, and attraction um, community. So some of the um, responsibilities that we have in attraction and tourism are focused on facilitating economic and tourism growth throughout Pima County and Southern Arizona. By design, our department is collaborative and works with many other county departments, flood control, parks, um, uh, attractions and tourism, property management, leased properties, to make sure that our visitors who come here have a wonderful experience and return again to spend their dollars. We fund our DMO, our designated marketing organization, Visit Tucson, and we work with them very closely as we get occupancy numbers for hotels and restaurants, um, numbers back in visitor dollars spent. We also work with AOT, the Arizona Office of Tourism, to make sure we have funding and promotion grants that are coming down to our community to make sure we can get that word out. We issue film permits out of our office for filming. We do a quick turnaround on those, whether they're commercial, still photography, or reality programming. We work to let people know we have a unique and beautiful landscape we have plenty of opportunities in areas where they can shoot, and we provide that information to them. We also fund outside agencies who promote and hold festivals, sporting events, um, food festivals throughout the community and make sure that those dollars are used well to provide tourism. We promote through social media, Pima Eats is our restaurant connection, so we can keep people informed of what new restaurants are opening, what new menus are out there, what experiences they might have. We also have opened and are operating the historic Pima County Courthouse, which has been a real game changer for us in terms of having uh, one spot where visitors can come and our residents to see what's available within the community. We partner with the U of A Gem and Mineral Museum and then also rental space within the courthouse that others can use. We were fortunate to bring an event last year where we spent a whole week introducing the Pima County Courthouse, the venues within it that were available for rental, and connecting people with that wonderful property that's ripe for holding events, festivals, and we've seen many of those return to downtown. Things were moving along nicely, as I said, everything was great, and then wham, COVID. Our feet were knocked out underneath us, and we began to focus on three clear initiatives to rebuild tourism and move forward. First, improve traveler confidence in visiting our community. It's safe to visit. 
Um, we've worked with health to make sure that visitors know vaccination rates, um, masking, all those types of things that if they do have health concerns, that our restaurants are, are safe and they can come here and enjoy. We also worked with understanding and tracking new market trends and the drivers of demand within the travel and tourism industry. It has changed. Our international business is not coming back quickly. What will happen is our leisure travel, which we're seeing, staycations, drive market business, and there's where we focused our dollars in getting people back. Over the past year, we've accelerated those those steps to tourism recovery, which begins locally. People and travelers tend to visit closer to home, visit local eateries, stay for a local vacation, travel domestically, and those where our dollars have gone. We include reaching out to our Canadian and Mexican visitors with the borders closed. They are now open and they're beginning to return. You've seen the announcement from TIA of Canadian flights for secondary cities, which is very important to us. And also from Mexico, our visitors coming over and feeling comfortable shopping and returning to our attractions. We focus uh, on building our strengths on what truly is unique to Pima County. Certainly our weather, our unique scenery is important. Um, and what we can promote with our wide open spaces, our recreational opportunities that are abundant. Hiking, biking, birding, all strong for us. Our designation is UNESCO City of Gastronomy certainly is popular and we grow those events by focusing festivals, dollars, and events. We work closely with Visit Tucson on grant dollars which we've received that will drive those visitations and up our lodging um, overnight stays and uh, attendance at our events. The our staff and volunteers in the Visitor Center have really focused on providing our visitors unique custom information for what they're interested in. So we found as they come to the Visitor Center, they're spending more time. I didn't know that was here. I didn't know that was available. I'm interested in culture, in history. What unique things might you put together for me? So we're certainly an outlet for letting people know what's there through our filming, our visitor uh, board, which gives all the highlights of ongoing events. They stay longer and they visit more venues. What challenges do we face in the future? Rebuilding the tourism industry here. Um, workforce is certainly an issue. Front of house, back of house for lodging, restaurants and hotels. They're having trouble filling open positions. It's important to us those are filled so visitors have a good expectation and good experience when they get here. We've worked with workforce development to provide um, other venues and possible hiring scenarios that might work for them. Repair, maintenance, and aging of our infrastructure at our leased properties is certainly something that we look at. As their attendance and revenue has gone down, Pima County has picked up some of those responsibilities to make sure that they're up to code, that the visitor has a good experience, and that people are feeling good about the front-facing part of that organization. Um, lack of funding for tourism from other entities is certainly a problem. Pima County is being looked for more and more to fund festivals, events, sporting events, where other entities have either stepped away or not providing funding. So we have some difficult choices to make as we move forward. Where do we get the most bang for the buck? 
how do we emphasize uh, visitors here and make sure we're getting a return on that investment. I wanna thank um, all the other Pima County departments and certainly the board for supporting our efforts. We will continue to work forward to build that and we get a report card every month. What do our occupancy levels look like against other like communities? What are our restaurants doing? How are our festivals and events moving forward? Pending any questions, I'm happy to answer any you might have. Go out there and eat, stay in the lodging, go to events. We will return and we'll return stronger and healthier. Thank you, any questions? All right, thank you. Thank um, you. Before we move on, we have two more presentations. Uh, Natural Resources, Parks and Rec and Stadium District. Um, you wanna take a 10 minute break? Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll reconvene in about 10 minutes at the sound of the gavel.
Okay, we're going to resume our May 11th, 2022 budget hearing meeting. And we will now go to Natural Resources, Parks and Rec. Welcome to your new position. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, County Administrator Lesher. I am Vic Pereira, and uh, today is day 13 for me as the uh, Director of Natural Resources, Parks and Rec. Well, at least it's not Friday the 13th. That's right. To my left, I have uh, Robert Padilla, and Robert's my deputy. He's been leading the team for the last four months um, as the former uh, director retired, and truly he's here for the uh, Q&A part for in case I need a lifeline or I need to phone a friend. So that's why Robert's here. Um, I've sent a uh, request to your staffs uh, to get on your calendar for a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and I look forward to connecting with each and every one of you here in the next couple of weeks. First, let me begin uh, by saying thank you. Uh, thank you for your sustained financial support to my uh, NPR budget because it allows my team to accomplish the mission and really further strengthen our ability to conserve and sustain the natural resource capacity, bolster, bolster our recreation services, and maintain and modernize our parks. I'd like to take a couple minutes here just to cover each division and really just champion uh, what the team has done last year uh, programmatically and just focus on what we have on the docket uh, for this year. Let me start off with the natural resources. As the manager of uh, the conservation land management program, um, our primary responsibility is to preserve the extraordinary landscape and diversity and cultural and natural resources for over a quarter of a million acres of fee-owned and Pima County leased land, which includes our 14 ranches, over 100 natural resource parks, three mountain parks, two preserves, and numerous open space properties. Our nursery team uh, was able to salvage over 8,300 native plants last year. Although COVID-19 dominated the narrative, that didn't stop our environmental education team as they adapted and they, um, excuse me, as they adapted and transformed from their normal hands-on education and training to a digital platform reaching over 30,000 people. Our restoration team, augmented by stalwart volunteers, treated nearly 2,000 acres of invasive plants at the Tucson Mountain Park. Our major initiative for last year, which recently completed at the beginning of this year, was the pond, reno pond renovation project at Agua Caliente Park. Water conservation through the reduction of groundwater, pumping from a well, that was our primary goal for this initiative. The project yielded a 75% reduction in annual groundwater use, which translates to 22 million gallons of water saved per year. Similarly, there was 64% in energy efficiency and savings in electrical use from our reduced groundwater pumping. Other enhancements included additional desert landscaping, pavement repairs, and construction of a new quarter mile nature and birding trail. These improvements targeted the nearly 200,000 individuals who visit the Agua Caliente Park yearly. This year, the team plans to focus on the historic Kanoa Ranch in Green Valley through a capital improvements project. We are renovating an adaptive reuse space in the Manning Senior House, which will accommodate a formal and informal gatherings, events, and meetings to include a casual dining cafe. Completion estimate is at the, end of the, at, at the end of this year. And currently, we estimated that there's about 100,000 visitors to Kanoa. And we hope that the result of this renovation will increase the foot traffic and also the revenue to the area. Our dedicated parks team manages, operates, and maintains over six river parks, 39 urban parks, and provides exemplary recreation opportunities for all Pima County residents regardless of age or activity through our multi-use sports fields and our ramadas. Additionally, the parks team maintains the 136 mile loop, which as you are keenly aware, just earned the top spot in the USA Today's Reader's Choice Travel Award contest as the best recreational trail for the second year in a row. As the longest public recreation multi-use path in the United States, this major visitor attraction strengthens our local economy and promotes fitness. 
With 10 counters positioned at various locations on the loop, there have been 3.3 million users as of 1 July to current date uh, on the loop. Projects for the upcoming year include two new multi-use sports fields with modern LED lights and restroom facilities at Manzanita Park, as well as LED conversion lights for McDonald Park and Thomas J. Park. A proposal that is currently in the works for the upcoming year is our sports field optimization initiative. While we are still in the process of data gathering, the end state is to promote equity amongst all sports teams and clubs who utilize this limited resource availability of sports fields in Pima County. Our intent is to promote equitable and inclusive field scheduling to ensure all sports teams, regardless of size, caliber, or affiliation, are able to utilize our beautifully maintained multi-use sports fields. Our unwavering recreation team operates 13 community centers, 11 pools and splash pads, and three shooting ranges, which includes the pistol, rifle, shotguns, and archery. Collectively, the recreation team tailors multiple programs to serve the full spectrum of Pima County constituents, from youths to teens to adults to our senior citizens. We have estimated that over 200,000 Pima County residents have used our shooting ranges, our community centers, pools uh, from last fiscal year to present. Additionally, 6, 000, excuse me, 60,000 attended the latest Rito horse racing season, and currently 2,000 people per weekend attend the farmer's market. To prepare for the upcoming swim season, we were able to repair and rehab two pools over the last year, one at the Northwest YMCA and the second being at the Catalina Pool. I'm also happy to report that while we are not 100% on lifeguard hiring for the current summer season, our team is feverishly juggling personnel and schedules to ensure that our main effort of swim lessons and swim teams will have zero interruptions. Last year's major project focused on LED conversion lighting at Mike Jacobs Sports Park. This energy efficiency of the LED lights will essentially move the sports park into a lower Tucson electrical power usage bracket, saving an immediate $80,000 per year at Pima County. And then finally, the trails team manages our 27 trailheads and associated hiking trails, which is aligned with the board adopted Eastern Pima County Regional Trails Master Plan. Since the beginning of the year, our 14 most high volume trails have been utilized by over 250,000 walkers, hikers, and mountain bikers exploring and enjoying the beautiful Sonoran Desert. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that my team works hand in hand and collaborates daily with some key partners in Pima County, which you've heard today as capital projects, regional flood control, attractions and tourism, and procurement, just to name a few. So as you can see, the NRPR team is extremely busy. We're devoted and we're truly making uh, Pima County, excuse, truly working for all of Pima County. I know it's only been 13 days, but I feel that uh, I have the best director's job um, as the uh, Parks and Rec director, because really everything we do enriches the lives of our residents and the hundreds of thousands of visitors who travel to the area. We maintain, we preserve, and we showcase the extraordinary Southern Air landscape, Arizona landscape. And additionally, our outstanding programs benefit all of Pima County residents, regardless of age, and we touch all four corners of the county. So pending any questions, that concludes my briefing. Any questions? Madam Supervisor Chair. Supervisor Christie. A couple of things. First, I want to thank uh, Robert Padilla for uh, orchestrating that great uh, Awa Cayente uh, dedication of the new ponds it was a terrific event well attended and well well structured so thank you for that very much um, who has ultimate control and authority and jurisdiction over the loop flood control or parks flood control flood control so they're in they're in charge of the, uh, any maintenance items any expansion items uh, new new connection no, new connectivity areas that's that's flood control so we uh, could you Mike, speak in this Mike. flood control owns the loop however uh, they provide us uh, finances and we provide all the maintenance on the loop so if there's a pothole in the in the loop that's, that's my team okay and 
Um, but the other issue that seems to be cropping up quite a bit are motorized vehicles on the loop uh, that are either being uh, uh, s snuck on um, and used. What what is the the status of that? What what is the 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 position of is it, it since it would be parks? Uh, I would assume that would be in in charge of monitoring that. What is what is the parks position on motorized vehicles? Uh, I should say more than anything the, the electric style. Right, we're talking about the e-bikes. Yeah. Robert, thank you. Chair Bronson, uh, Supervisor Christie. Well, um, we've in, in past years, we've been working with county administration uh, as well as risk management. Um, they, they have agreed with our concept that um, no e-bikes are allowed on the loop simply because for safety reasons. And uh, however, uh, we understand there's more uh, pressure uh, coming to you, to your respective offices, to al allow e-bikes. And again, our, our position is this is a, a policy decision by the board. And uh, I've already spoken to risk management and, and, and given them a heads up that you know there there may be a, a shift in allowing e-bikes on the loop and they need to be thinking uh, and also working with our department and how we can lessen the impact of, of e-bikes on, on multi-use paths. I know your offices have received uh, information from constituents. There's there are certain user groups that do not want e-bikes on the loop. Um, uh, your respective offices have uh, received notices from uh, the equestrian groups. Uh, one of the issues um, that I've uh, mentioned with Vic here is the most aggrieved user is the pedestrian, and that's that's the user group that you haven't heard from. Oh so, yes, we have. Well, not all, right. So the cycling community is is more organized, and so they're they're certainly spearheading the effort to allow e-bikes. And uh, but but we see conflict on the loop every single day. It's a popular amenity, multi-use uh, amenity, but because of that, there's also a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. And, and so is there a plan in place or coming in on, on how to address that conflict? We're, we are, we're working with the county administration. And again, <laughs> you know, this is, this is a policy decision. So if, if, if uh, the but board- But it's also a risk management decision. Absolutely, absolutely. And they've been involved with the discussion. So, so will that, that come before the board as, as something to, for board action or will it come from the administration or what do I tell my, my constituents that are matter now that there's e-bikes running them down off the road? Right. The so we will work, or we're working with our, our uh, deputy county administrator, Mr. Uh, DeBonis, and um, so we're working with county admin. I, I assume county admin will um, forward something uh, for your consideration. Okay. Um, that would be great because we, I don't know quite how to, to respond other than uh, I guess I could quote some kind of a statute that says that uh, motorized electric bikes are not allowed on the loop or, or whatever. But Chair sure, Bronson, fine. if I may, and Supervisor Christie, we'll be glad to, to get with you and get some language for everyone. At this point, it's very simple that e-bikes aren't allowed, but we do not have staff out there policing it every day. So we want to make sure that we provide a way for you to not only get the message out, but to have a, an in, a location for you to direct calls and complaints. Thank you. Thank you for that. And also down in Green Valley, the, th the three new parks we have down there, the, the new um, uh, open park uh, we have in, in the Green Valley area, who, who is in charge of those as well? Is that flood control or is it parks and rec? So we, we, we have, uh, correct, we have three parks. So the, the urban park component is Kanoa Preserve Park and that's managed by our Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, we have the historic Kanoa Ranch. The historic compound is under Parks and Rec management. However, uh, flood control uh, took ownership of the former Kanoa Ranch golf course. And so, but uh, we're a contractor to flood control, so they pay our staff to sweep the path, okay. mow, et cetera. And also, uh, on the historic Kanoa Ranch footprint, um, there's a portion of uh, RFCD land that they've converted into a 30-acre uh, restoration site. That's also RFCD land, but they're uh, paying our staff to manage and maintain it. So if there is an issue or a complaint or a problem with any of those parks, who goes, who, what, where should you go first to lodge that issue? Well, if, if it's related, if it's related to uh, 
bottom line is we have staff that manage it. So if, if they just notify our staff, uh, we, will, we work closely with flood control and uh, we, we will share input and if, if there's something that requires a capital improvement, we will work with flood control unless it's our property that we meant. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Um, Chair Bronson, Supervisor. So in our meeting, Mr. Badia, we had a meeting and before you were on, we had a meeting, um, our office scheduled a meeting to discuss this presentation and one of the things that came up was that there is um, two million dollars in funding for a list of, of projects and it's kind of an ongoing list you continue to add to it and I um, you know I, I would like the board to consider at some point looking at that list of projects and how it impacts the entire county and perhaps allocating more funding to be able to address some of those concerns and so, because right now, that right now we're kind of set at two million. Is that right? Yeah. Correct. And those are projects that affect. Can you just, for the other board members, kind of review the kinds of projects that are on that sure. list? Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Chair Bronson, Supervisor Grijalva. Um, Supervisor Grijalva is referring to the Parks Renewal Fund, right. uh, working with county administration um, uh, and. Thank you for that approval, by the way. <laughs> uh, they've, uh, they've approved $2 million for the Parks Department simply to address deferred maintenance. maintenance. Th this is not new facilities. This is strictly deferred maintenance. So we're, we're using those dollars to uh, refurbish a pool. So for example, we just um, replastered the Catalina Regional Pool. That was about $125,000. And that's just chip out the old plaster install new. We haven't touched any improvements in the pump room or the decking, right? So uh, so we're trying to do one pool a year. We're trying to replace one to two playgrounds per year. And we have 96 playgrounds in our inventory. And each playground is at least six figures to replace. So just playgrounds alone, it's 9.6 million. And so we're trying to do one to two playgrounds a year replacement. Uh, we're doing, uh, we're resurfacing sport courts, uh, tennis courts, basketball courts. Uh, we're replacing our uh, dilapidated bleachers at our uh, parks. Um, we're doing a lot of pavement preservation as well. We have, you know, some, some aging uh, parking lots that need tender loving care. So there, there's just a variety of, of projects that we're heading. Rest but again, room. this is just deferred Rest maintenance. Rooms, yeah. Restrooms are on that Rest list too. So I just, deal. you know, I know that our budget is going to be tight, but I do think that that is, this renewal fund is something that affects all of our districts. And so Good point. just and to kind of bring it I, up. And you, I think we're alluding to this, but so you're making these decisions about which park gets what, how? Well, uh, at the, at the, during budget uh, formulation, I, I, I asked my team to provide me a list of all deferred maintenance and to prioritize them. And then I sit down with the director and we basically go over the list and we determine, okay, what's, what's the highest priority? And then we also try to uh, make improvements in all five districts, not just focus in one district. And so we try to share the love, so to speak. And so, but yeah, so the highest priority needs, uh, we will hit those first. Okay, and how do you determine highest priority? Well, for example, when we first came on, we had playgrounds that were um, uh, enclosed in orange fencing, right? They were deemed unsafe by risk management. We simply did not have the money to replace it. And so we're looking at items that are safety, health and safety related okay. first. Got it, all right. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, again, uh, welcome aboard to your new position and uh, looking forward to working with you as we move through this budget cycle. And then uh, we've got lots of interesting challenges in District 3 when it comes to Parks and Rec, so I'm sure you'll be hearing from us. I think we may have already set up a meeting. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to Stadium District and Kino Sports Complex. Chairman Bronson, members of the board, thank you. Last but not least, I'll make this short kind of batting cleanup to get you out to lunch there. Um, 
I it's am called on the seven, seventh inning stretch. So right you had that, so we're going to finish this up here and not go into extra innings. Um, I have the honor and privilege of being the director of the Kino Sports Complex for the past six years. Um, we had a little bit of a hiccup for two years with the pandemic, but we are slowly and quickly coming out of that. Um, I'm really excited to say that we are back on target for where we were when we shut down um, in 2020, which is a great thing. Um, so um, we have a number of different activities that go on for the community, not only at the professional level with FC Tucson Soccer and the Tucson Sugar Skulls, which use our facility to practice at, um, but we go all the way down to youth sports for baseball and soccer. Um, in addition to sports, we are also one of the premier outdoor entertainment venues. We just finished up two weekends ago having the Centurions in for the sixth year in a row. Um, they only missed one year because of the pandemic and they kind of doubled up. They were there in October and then came back and they had one of their largest crowds um, ever with about 6,500 in attendance that, um, that evening there. We also do a lot of uh, community work with the Community Food Bank right down the street. Um, as you know, we were a food bank distribution site during the pandemic and um, now we're assisting them with storage of their big semi-trucks in one of our remote lots um, just down the street, which helps them out quite a bit. Um, our attendance was pretty stable through the pandemic. Unfortunately, it wasn't the kind of attendance we wanted with um, it being a vaccine and a testing and a food bank distribution site, but it kept us going and um, all staff were, were continued to be employed and work throughout that, um, that time frame. Um, most of you have been out to the facility so you know that our biggest asset is the green stuff that grows around the facility and um, you should um, take great pride in the fact that we are the premier outdoor sports facility in the state, if not one of the regions that offer all natural grass fields. There's larger facilities, but they have some artificial s surfaces, some um, grass surfaces, but nothing like, um, like we have. And so we have that distinction and um, Phoenix does not have that. So that's, that's a plus for us on, on that and, and there. Um, as I mentioned, we have sports events, we have community events, but one of the areas that we have um, really sustained a huge growth is is other departments using our facility. So um, Thursday we have a job fair with the One Stop and we've had the city county job fairs with the HR department. We are doing um, the uh, probation officers award luncheon in the summer. So that's good for those departments to be able to come to a location that's a county facility and not have to necessarily force out big dollars to go rent a facility and, and we're glad to, to have them because it again shows our diversity out there and not just the sporting area but also in, in other areas. Um, one of the big um, events we have coming up this um, fall is the award for the National Junior College Athletic Association Division II men's and women's soccer event. This was spearheaded um, by Pima College and Visit Tucson and uh, they had uh, visits out to the facility on two different occasions and were so enamored by it that they decided to pick us up for this year and if a great turnout and a great event is held then we have the option of the of uh, the second year. Um, tourism is a big portion of what we do and one of the happy signs this year has been um, our hotel bed tax dollars have um, exceeded our projections by almost a million dollars. Unfortunately our car rental tax which we also get a portion of has not. <laughs> um, people just aren't renting cars for not only the cost but the gas. Um, we're seeing that a little bit with um, state events where even the Phoenicians don't want to pay the gas to drive down here. It doesn't seem to be affecting our regional and national events because most of them will fly in and they rent either buses or big vans to get around. So that's that's pretty constant there. Um, we did also get word this week that our friends from South Korea Baseball who took a two-year hiatus, they left right before everything shut down um, in 2020, are coming back and want a three-year agreement with us. So um, 
where um, we work hand in hand with my left <laughs> um, of tourism. Uh, that is a big boon because they are here for anywhere between four and six weeks and bring anywhere between 40 and 75 personnel with them. So that's a lot of hotel nights, a lot of um, extra activities as such. Um, one of the biggest challenge that we are having is like everyone else, staffing, supply chain, the cost of things. One of our other biggest challenges is weather. Um, so we're being an outdoor facility. We are open basically seven days a week and we average over 300 days a year that we have activity going on. Um, we don't like to get rained out, but we love rain in between because it definitely keeps the pond filled at the curb and keeps our um, purchase of reclaimed water much lower than, than we need it to be. Um, we just converted four baseball fields um, to the help of on my right, the capital projects unit, we took four baseball fields, which were the old style metal halide lights, which just suck electricity, and they are now converted to LED lights, which is going to be an interesting comparison over the next year of how much we anticipate saving. And then we are in the process of also lighting two additional baseball fields, which will again um, attract bigger tournaments out to the facility that need those lighted fields, especially during the warmer months. Um, other than that, um, we're just plugging away and, and we're working when everybody else wants to play. So if you have any questions. Any questions? Yeah, just quickly, how many years have you been in charge out there? Six. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. All right. Something's wrong. That concludes our presentations for this morning. We'll take a brief recess and reconvene, I think, 1.30. Oh, I'm sorry, we need to adjourn, not recess. We're going to adjourn this morning session. Oh, do we call to the public? There's nobody here, right? Okay, um, all right. We'll adjourn if there are no objections and we will meet again. We'll begin the second session at 1.30.